the living environment. We talk about it a lot today, but it was a popular topic for a very long time already. City environments got significantly worse since the start of the Industrial Revolution, and then more after the Second World War, with the new industry and cars. By 1970s and 1980s, the topic became very important and started to have real political consequences, even in the Communist Eastern Bloc. So that's exactly going to be the topic of today's video, state of the living environment in the later 1980s in Communist Central Europe. How people saw it, how people reacted to it. In our city of Altengrad, I'm going to build a couple of things, somewhat related to the environment, you will immediately see what they are. It is not hard to introduce how the environment looked back in the day, because pretty much everything we said in the series before clearly points to one possible outcome. It got much worse. We already talked about the expansion of industry, need for much higher power generation, cutting down city blocks to make way for urban highways, introducing many more cars, and so on and so on. That's pretty much the common development for the entire world post-Second World War. The Eastern Bloc was no exception, although some things were approached differently with different outcomes. So let's introduce the environmental situation here in more detail. And I'm of course focusing on Central Europe, not the Soviet Union, even though many things are very similar. Central Europe was already quite industrialized region before the Second World War, especially towards the West, significantly less towards the East. After the post-war communist takeovers, the main goals of the late 1940s and early 1950s was a massive switch to heavy industry. Huge money was poured into that sector and like I already talked about it in the 1950s videos, the investments were so large that communist Central Europe was ahead in GDP growth compared to the West in that brief time period. Pretty much no one would dare question this industrial expansion due to environmental concerns, as it was heavily tied to the entire political line of creating a better post-war world with new technologies, new possibilities, and of course newly working society. It was exactly that typical so-called builder's narrative of the 1950s, building new industry, but also building new society. In economic growth terms, it would be the extensive growth type, meaning growing through quantity. This growth was not quite smooth, was not going exactly as planned, but again, we already covered that in the 1950s part of this series, so you can go check that if you want, it's been a while. In Czechoslovakia back in the day, and even today, there is a very popular phrase, quote, we will command the wind and rain, end quote, which is mostly used in a sort of mocking way today when talking about some policies of the communist leaderships regarding the environment. Basically, when humans did some big, usually negative, change to the environment, thinking that it's positive for us and nature just needs to make way. This phrase apparently originated exactly from the builders' propaganda from one particular song of the 1950s. The phrase, however, nicely covers the overall approach to the environment back then. Nature is just something that mindlessly exists, and we as humans have every right to change it to our liking, to how we want it to work for us. Typically then, it is used when talking about water projects around here, since there are so many dams, weirs, reservoirs, logs, and so on and so on, built in the 50s and 60s. I also made a video about that. Somewhat common projects back then were also narrowing of rivers or little streams, paving their profiles and removing unwanted greenery around. Something that proved to be a big mistake for many reasons, from flood performance to local biodiversity. Apparently, water engineering was one of the most prestigious fields you could study in civil engineering back then. And just a little side note, many of the highest officials of the Chinese Communist Party are water engineers. And there are many huge water projects in China. Coincidence? From the Soviet Union, we could for example look at the entire disastrous history of destruction of the Aral Sea and Stalin's, quote, great plan for the transformation of nature, end quote. Typical example of we will command the wind and rain, except nature doesn't always play along. 
So that was water, big and small projects to tame its power, but with some inevitable consequences. Arguably not something people would immediately notice, unless they lost access to water or on the other hand had too much of it because of flooding. But something everyone would notice would be the worse air quality. Expanding heavy industry means many more huge factories and power plants burning all kinds of materials and letting it go into the air. Back in the 1950s, something like properly filtering out the more dangerous parts was not exactly done, was not even considered a problem. Although this kind of pollution is certainly much more noticeable by people, especially on a bad day when the smoke stays in the city and creates a huge fog, leaving ash everywhere. Here we can note the Great Smog of London from 1952, a huge pollution event mostly caused by burning coal. Coal is absolutely crucial material when talking about air pollution in Central Europe. Even today, it is unfortunately the most popular energy source. Back in the day, it was even more important. There are many kinds of coal based on their age, roughly. The highest quality coal, black coal or anthracite or bituminous coal are usually found deep underground, so are difficult to obtain, but are the best for burning. Although it's still coal, you don't want to inhale the fumes 24 seven, of course. The worst coal to burn, on the other hand, is lignite or brown coal. It produces around one third of energy compared to black coal, but most importantly produces a yummy mix of all kinds of dangerous pollutants. Unfortunately, mining brown coal is relatively easy as it's not deep. Central Europe is rich in brown coal, but it's certainly not a region with most of it. Far from it, actually, but it is mined here a lot. Let's look at some numbers to put things into perspective. This table summarizes the production of the two coals by countries until the year 2018. United States, China and USSR are here for comparison. Uh, USSR is just counted as some of Russia, Kazakhstan and Ukraine, biggest coal miners. Germany is whole Germany. Hungary did not even appear in any black coal rankings, so there are no numbers here. But look at brown coal, and here the situation is vastly different. China and United States practically don't mine any compared to black. Soviet Union significantly less, but for Central Europe significantly more, except Poland. Germany and Czechia are basically brown coal superpowers. Hungary was at some point on par with China. Around 300 million tons of the German production is actually just East Germany alone, so huge difference between the two. And that brown coal was mostly burned domestically for making power, because brown coal is not much suited for anything else. One other interesting statistic that puts the willingness of obtaining brown coal around here into perspective. United States have the largest world deposits of brown coal, but compared to peak production, they were only getting some 0.006% a year of that. Germany has vastly smaller deposits, far smaller than Poland, for example, but were getting some 1% a year in peak production of the 1980s. So in other words, pushing coal mining way, way more. Other interesting statistic for brown coal is related to the reserves. Now, reserves are the kind of deposits currently mineable, so with current technologies, while making profit, and I guess in already open mines, although I'm not sure about the last one. Anyways, the reserve for United States compared to total deposits is only 3.4%. In other words, Americans are not mining brown coal as much as they could, not even close while in Germany that ratio is 90%. So basically every deposit the Germans have, they already mine. Although this could also mean that American geologists were just more thorough in their exploration of deposits, hard to say. Still, massive difference which only illustrates the absolute gigantic role of coal, and especially brown, in Central European power production. Germany today is still number one world producer and burner of brown coal and out of the European countries only, followed by Russia, Poland and Czechia, all former Eastern Bloc countries.
The European brown coal rankings are only broken by Greece, for some reason, but all the other top brown coalers are former communist countries. Coincidence? So overall, burning coal and a lot of brown coal significantly worsened the air pollution around here, while London from the 1950s started to frown upon coal burning, communist Central Europe saw smoking chimneys as a sign of progress. And that is not an exaggeration. Smoking chimney was literally on post stamps in various logos, propaganda posters, magazine covers, everywhere as a universal symbol of better tomorrow. In 1978, United Nations released a statistic for concentration of sulfur dioxide in the air and ranked East Germany as number one, followed by Belgium for some reason and Czechoslovakia. Since the 1950s, some filtering systems were employed to catch big particles of ash, but that was it. Further efforts focused on trying to disperse the pollution more by building taller smokestacks and just focusing on diluting the contaminants. But applying more advanced filtering was not done. Why? It was just not a priority. Throughout the whole four decades of communist rule, there was strong emphasis on extensive growth, not intensive. So not improving manufacturing efficiencies, but rather building more industry. In the 1980s, some attempts were made, but it was too little too late. Pollution is a consequence of that. Inefficient manufacturing requires more power and resources, so more pollution, while not investing in filtration or better technologies, just outputs more pollutants on top of that. And, well, authoritarian politics are clearly involved in all of that, so brushing aside or even attacking environmental concerns as disruptions of progress, creating the official narrative that pollution is just inevitable part of living in a modern world. What, you would like to live in a cave or something? Be glad you have energy, warmth and packed food in stores, you ungrateful eco-terrorist. This actually kind of sounds like something you could hear even today, right? Obviously the problem is not binary, like zero pollution, total pollution, zero modern achievements, complete modern achievements. Efficiency of production, technologies of production, total consumption, policies and so on vastly change the outcomes. But such debate was not possible back in the day. Air quality or overall the whole living environment was something people clearly felt. So the regimes could not just say it's not happening, it obviously was. The propaganda of the time mostly focused on exactly shifting the discussion into it's necessary, it must be like that. Although something like health risks and alarming statistics of rising health problems or massive exceeding of pollutant norms were all information that were actively kept from the public. When things related to air quality were reported, they were usually presented with the typical style of it is what it is. It's happening, but it's not too bad. Don't think too much about it. I randomly found a book from the 1970s. It's an encyclopedia of fauna and flora of Czechoslovakia. And in the introduction, the author writes, I'm paraphrasing, due to increasing industrial production and traffic, especially the city environment is not great. But don't worry, the Communist Party prepared for every worker special holiday programs in the countryside where you can enjoy our beautiful nature. So exactly, the author did not question the pollution, but could freely say it exists and it's caused by industry and cars. But it's fine, it's just happening, don't worry about it, you can go to a mountain resort once a year which fixes that somehow. Similarly, I found a television interview with an urban scientist. It was related to something else, to the very typical practice of city people to have a flat in the city, as well as a little allotment or bigger cottage, a dacha in the countryside. The scientist was asked, why is this so popular? And the reply was very straightforward. People do not want to spend their time in cities due to pollution, noise and lack of proper public spaces. But no follow-up about improving that situation or anything like that. No, it is what it is, that's the situation. It's something very common in these old interviews, programs, books and magazines. Things are happening, we can report how things are, we can maybe slightly explain why, but zero questioning of deeper causes, zero questioning of officials and the official narratives and policies. 
just simple acceptance of reality that the elites create. This started to very quickly change in the late 1980s. The environment was the worst in early 80s. It was no longer possible to just say it's part of modern progress because it started to look like the direct opposite. Huge forests, especially in the mountains, were destroyed by acid rains. Health of the population deteriorated, especially in children. Big parts of inner cities were practically unlivable due to noise and traffic. Pollution and fine particles stuck on facades, turning them black over time because old buildings were rarely maintained. Rivers had all kinds of chemicals in them and so on and so on and so on. Even slightly loosening the censorship in the late 1980s opened way for the population to heavily focus on the environment and demand change. Just a little note about cars. Catalytic converters, the parts of the exhaust responsible for not letting some toxic stuff out, were not required in cars in the Eastern Bloc. A funny situation then happened in the late 1980s when cars intended for Western export already had catalytic converters, among many other improvements, while domestic versions were bare bones without any of that. Nuclear energy played a big role in the entire environmental development. The Chernobyl disaster happened exactly in the right time to undermine the regimes and further convince the populations that change is needed. Just like in the Soviet Union, the populations in Central Europe were not informed well about the consequences, but it only fueled the general distrust and as more information started to go through, it became clear that the regimes are willing and able to just lie about the environment. People realized that and saw that maybe all the coal smoke is not a sign of progress. The idea of we will command the wind and rain became a joke at this point. Environmental concerns started to be seen in various media and started to have political impacts. In Hungary, protesters demanded stopping the gigantic project of the Nagymaros Dam. In Czechoslovakia, the secret police apparently prepared a special report for the government mentioning that the environmental concerns have very real potential of erupting into serious civil unrest, which it did and somewhat preceded the events of the Velvet Revolution. Poland was paradoxically not that bad in the 80s because the general economic and political crisis meant lower industrial production and basically stopped its expansion. Poland even created Ministry of Environmental Protection in 83, but it didn't do much and environmental problems persisted. Since Poland was already heavily engulfed in wide anti-government protests, it was much easier to present accurate environmental information to the public, which only fueled the unrest more. So overall, the environment was just one layer, one piece of the dissatisfaction with the ruling regimes, although very important one. This is certainly not the last time we will talk about the environment, since we must continue it in more recent decades to see if things changed. But now, let's go into the city. So as you could have already seen, this episode was not exactly heavy with projects, uh, big projects, but I really wanted to make an episode about the environment as it was kind of important, we really should cover it. So I just took the opportunity to build some smaller projects that wouldn't really fit anywhere else. So we started with the landfill outside of the city, very close to the cement factory and the nuclear power plant, for example, you know, that direction. I kind of showed in the time lapse uh, the, uh, the entire map and then I just zoomed in to that location so that you know where it is. Uh, then I was uh, doing the quarry, the cement factory, because uh, it obviously needed some kind of expansion. We built it in the 50s, if I'm not mistaken. So obviously since then uh, it must have extended because a lot of materials were already excavated and processed. Uh, then I've just built a little wastewater treatment plant. I just, you know, did not really bother with it too much. I just placed down uh, the kind of assets that I have uh, from the pack for the wastewater treatment plant and just a couple of networks and some buildings around it. And that was it. I actually wanted to do that kind of project in the 30s already, but I did not really find a suitable land for it. But uh, for some reason, that place right next to the harbor now felt perfect. I don't really know why it didn't back in the day, but uh, now it did, so there it is. Now, then I was doing some kind of a clearing of old city blocks or like low density blocks near the exhibition center. 
and I was preparing some kind of a construction site there. So what could that possibly be? I was uh, kind of indicating that there might be some sort of uh, open pit, like, uh, I don't know, some entrance to some infrastructure, maybe? Hmm? I don't know. We will have to see what it's going to turn into in the 90s, 2000s, something like that. Then I went into the city center, into the old town square, and I just turned it into a big parking lot. The inspiration was drawn, of course, from Prague's old town square, which used to be a big parking lot before it was turned into a pedestrian zone in some, some recent decades. I'm not actually sure if it happened in the 90s or uh, 2000s, but, uh, but it definitely was a parking lot. I was already showing some pictures of that place in some previous episodes. So I just wanted to do that, uh, you know, because I wanted to illustrate that even the man-made environment, city centers and these kinds of squares also changed, also somehow evolved for better or worse. Now I went into the old industrial zone, the biggest one in the city, and I just uh, kept adding these uh, smoke effects to all the smokestacks and these pipes. Uh, I was uh, doing this in Altengrad after I did all of these effects in Asturias. I was obviously aware of the effects module from like years ago already, but for some reason I never used it for these kinds of purposes before I heavily detailed uh, with As in Asturias with these. So. Uh, you know, it's just going to add to the entire uh, feel that, uh, yeah, this place is probably not exactly very clean and uh, living next to this industrial zone is probably not the best thing ever. This pretty much wraps up the 1980s. The next episode, 89, is going to be the last episode of the 80s and the entire communist era in Central Europe. It's completely coincidental that it just so happened that the episode numbers also match uh, somewhat the years, or in this case they are exactly going to match the years uh, that I'm in, in with the city, but, uh, but it was not planned at all. I explained many times before that some of the projects that I was building in the city were not exactly chronological. Uh, they were somewhat specific to that decade, but uh, I was just like randomly building them inside that decade. Not really here because, uh, you know, this is episode 88, talking about the environment. That's actually kind of fitting for that specific year. And I was already hinting into in, in the introduction of the development going into 1989 with all the environmental protests. That would eventually evolve in the entire anti-regime protests as well. And, you know, the eventual fall of the regimes. So that's what we are going to talk about in the next episode. Don't worry, I'm also going to be building, I'm actually going to be doing a very disgusting change in the city center. I'm going to be adding some more modern structures and, uh, well, I'm not going to spoil anything, but, uh, you know, stay tuned for that. I'm going to be only talking about the 89, though. I'm not going to be talking about the future just yet, because... I would like to do episode 90, so two episodes from now, where I'm just going to do cinematics only, going to look at everything we built post Second World War in the city and all the things that changed uh, after the Second World War. So that it's going to be kind of like a recap, like a summary of everything that happened so that, you know, if you've been following the series, then uh, the series started like three, four years ago, something like that. So I definitely don't blame you if you don't remember everything. Uh, I kind of don't sometimes. So it's just going to be like a summary. And, uh, you know, we can just start from there into the 90s. Uh, I see it kind of frequently, these uh, past couple of episodes in comments, people saying that I should build this and that. And a lot of, lot of things I already built, you know, or a lot of things I already covered or talked about. So I would really like to do an episode where I'm just going to do like a, like a summary. And if you just want more, want more details about those particular topics, you can always just go to those episodes. I'm probably going to do something like I did with the final episode of, um, of the Aurelia series. I'm just going to uh, write down the episode numbers below in the corner somewhere. And you can just quickly go there if you are interested in more details. 
Well, anyways, these cinematics. This is the landfill. That's probably the biggest project for today. And as you can see, I actually enabled the seagulls, the vanilla seagulls that are flying over parks and even parking lots back in the day. That's why everyone turned them off years ago and just forgot about them, including me. I actually had no idea how to even turn them back on. Uh, I just had to browse through some of the mods and then I found finally found the settings. But they are absolutely perfect for this particular landfill project. And uh, this little diorama here with the garbage truck and the bulldozer, I'm kind of proud of with, uh, with just the seagulls flying around making the entire scenery look uh, just moving, you know, a little alive, not completely static. Uh, there were also those other projects. I also showed that a uh, couple of shots with the smoggy look of Altengrad to just make you think that the city is not looking as clean as I always show it because, uh, you know, city skylines... Uh, in City Skylines, you cannot really control the state of the buildings, I was already talking about the last time. So they are definitely looking way too clean in the city right now, and all the surfaces. I would just have to put decals everywhere if I wanted to make them uh, dirtier, muddier, and these kinds of things. So, you know, we just have to use our imagination a little to, uh, to just imagine Altengrad as a real city and not uh, just a bunch of pixels. Anyways, that's gonna be it for today. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, then you can do all the technicalities below the video. You know the drill to help it. And big thanks to channel members who are directly supporting this channel and me in what I'm doing here. Hugely appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much. Take care. Goodbye.